All right, we're going to get started. We're going to um, talk about transcutaneous CO2 monitoring and just want to thank the Centec company uh, for sponsoring this event and more importantly, a gold star to everybody who has hung on. Uh, what are we into our 11th hour of the, of the conference? So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some clinical applications and then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the new technology and uh, transcutaneous CO2 monitoring. So uh, I'm going to start off and talk about some of the clinical applications and I'm missing the pointer. Is this it? Nope. You can point it that way. That's, oh, here it is. Found it. I've gotten so used to doing that today. So anyway, so when I, when I was writing this title, I couldn't help but think of my friend Buzz Lightyear to infinity and beyond. So uh, my kids are now 10 and 12, so we don't have too much Buzz Lightyear any, anymore. So uh, just as far as uh, declarations, uh, this presentation is supported by Centec. Um, they do make the transcutaneous monitor that we're going to talk a lot about, and they have supported my research, um, but I don't have any proprietary interests in the company. And again, there's my email, which I've given out too many times today, but write it down. If you want a copy of the slides, I'll be happy to share them with you. So I appreciate everybody that's already emailed me, and hopefully I got back to everybody. Um, so there are really two transcutaneous monitors on the market. I've used both of them. What we're going to talk about, you know, I think applies to, to either one. I've used both of them in my clinical practice for my research. Uh, this is the radiometer brand and then the newer one by Centec. Um, we'll talk about some of the advantages of this monitor. I think it has more options as far as placement techniques and um, a little more easy, I think, as far as uh, you're putting the ear clip on or places you can put it on some of the older patients. Um, so why do we need transcutaneous CO2 monitoring? Well, I think most of us will agree our clinical assessment is inaccurate. I think we've all drawn a blood gas and been surprised that the PCO2 is 20 or it's 90 and we're like, oops, how did that happen? And obviously ABG analysis is the gold standard, but I've always told people you get an instantaneous value of what is a continuously changing clinical picture. You know, by the time that value comes back, things could be, be very different. Obviously, it requires an invasive procedure. I mean, like your ICUs, we're always faced with a large population of kids with bronchiolitis who are on high flow nasal cannula or CYPAP or BiPAP or something. And it's like, these kids really don't need an art line, but I would love to know what their CO2 is. So I think those are sorts of the patients uh, that uh, you know, we're talking about. And the, even some of the more critically ill patients where a continuous CO2 value would be very very helpful. You know, obviously there are consequences of invasive procedures and, and again you get that one value and you really wonder, you know, what's going on an hour later. You know, it used to take a long time for a blood gas to come back. Um, I remember, you know, I've done this for 30 years now almost. We'd send the blood gas down, you get the little printout. Well, I have to change my slide. We now have point of care testing, so there's really not much of a delay in getting your blood gas back. And I think these devices are really helpful when you want to maintain normal, card, normal carbia. I mean, we've talked about patients, you know, with single ventricle physiology where hyper or hypoventilation may impact your QPQS. And so I think it's very helpful. We know in patients with traumatic brain injury that hypocarbia is bad. In the neonatal population, if you overventilate, you know, you're at risk for increasing white matter disorders and disease. So I think there are a lot of patients where we really want to maintain normal carbia. You know, alternatively, can we use venous or capillary gases instead of an arterial blood gas? And I'll show you some studies. And to me, the venous POC, PCO2 means very little. All it's going to tell you is that your arterial is going to be lower. And I'll show you some data that suggests that it may be a better monitor of cardiac output really than ventilation status. And so this is a study looking at cap gases, a capillary blood gas. These were done in neonates. And what you find is that although the correlation really isn't bad, 
that when you have hypotension, the correlation gets a lot worse. And think about what happens as you drop your cardiac output. You know, the same reason that your venous PO2 drops your venous CO2 rises, so you have less blood coming through the capillary system, and your body has to put the same amount of CO2 into that blood. So as your cardiac output drops, your arterial to venous CO2 gradient increases. And so we have found that that gradient is actually a pretty good marker of cardiovascular status. Now, if you have a bronchiolytic in the ICU and you're worried about their status, you know their cardiac output's good, you get that venous PO2 or that capillary PCO2 and it's 40 or 45, you know you're doing fine, okay? It's just when you get that high value, you really don't know what it means. And this is a, a study in adults. They looked at venous versus arterial blood gas values. And what they found was that gradient widens in patients with inadequate cardiac output, congestive heart failure. So again, there's a widening of that gradient as cardiac output drops. This is a study we did years ago looking at infants who had had cardiothoracic surgery. And we found that as the venous saturation drops, the gradient increases. So if you pick up a textbook, it talks about a gradient of five. The venous PCO2 is supposed to be 45. Um, your arterial PCO2 is supposed to be 40, but that's with a venous sat of 75%. As that saturation drops, the venous PCO2 rises just as the venous PO2 decreases. And so, in fact, that venous PCO2 reflects cardiac output more than it reflects ventilation. And a couple adult studies, one in, I'm sorry, one in adults and one in infants that shows you can actually use that gradient to be predictive of outcomes so that patients with a high arterial to venous CO2 gradient are not going to do as well. So let's talk about continuous non-invasive CO2 monitoring. And I think as ICU doctors, as anesthesiologists, there are really two ways, end tidal CO2 monitoring and transcutaneous CO2 monitoring. And I'm the first one to say, we're not talking about one or the other, we're talking about probably using both of these together. We use end tidal, the technology is just infrared absorption. So CO2 absorbs infrared light and the amount of CO2 in the sample, the amount of uh, infrared lights is absorbed is reflective of the amount of CO2 in the sample. So pretty easy technology. And we're all used to looking at the capnogram. And to me, it's not only the end tidal value, but if you're like me, you love to look at this capnogram. It tells you how the patient is emptying. You know, is the plateau flat? Is it upsloping? Do you have problems with ventilation perfusion, which are reflected in the capnogram? You've all had bronchospasm, and you can see that slope change dramatically. Two, two types of device. You know, the side stream sampling and then the inline devices. I think most ICUs have gone to the side stream sampling. These devices were bulky and heavy, and you might as well tie a string around your endotracheal tube and slam the door and pull it out because I think the only things this did was, you know, it made sure you had a big heavy weight on your endotracheal tube and you got to reintubate a few kids every night. Um, so the other thing that's come about is a lot of technology in measuring end tidal CO2 when you're not intubated. So, you know, these came out, Salter Labs developed these nasal cannulas so you could give oxygen through one and, and measure CO2 through the others. I'm old enough that I remember taking just a regular nasal cannula, I'm sure some people in the room have done that, and you stuck a little needle or a IV cannula in there and you hook that up to your end tidal sampling device so you could sample end tidal CO2. And again, earlier this morning we talked about procedural sedation and monitoring end tidal. So I think, you know, these devices we're going to use more and more. And now they've got the fancy ones. So instead of monitoring through one and giving oxygen through the others, you monitor and give oxygen through both. And then they've got these, if you're mouth breathing, you can monitor. And we have all sorts of variations in our ICU because we do a lot of end tidal CO2 monitoring in patients that are extubated as we're using opioids to monitor respiratory function. 
And I've not used these, but you can actually monitor it through a mask. I think the accuracy would be very dependent on how high your oxygen flow is, but I think it would, again, just tell you basically, is your patient still breathing or not? And then lots of different end tidal devices with various displays. Some are very portable, others obviously hook into our central monitoring system. This is a study I did years ago. These are extubated patients monitoring with nasal cannula. They have no uh, lung disease, and we found a great correlation. The majority of the samples were pretty darn close. Uh, good linear correlation. So again, in the absence of lung disease, end tidal works great. It's quick, it's easy to set up. There's not a lot of calibration time. You know, documents the endotracheal tube is in the trachea. So again, we're not talking about using one device or the other, but maybe using them both to, together. But there are certain disease processes, various patient factors that are going to interfere with the accuracy of end tidal CO2 monitoring. And I think, you know, we've all uh, been through medical school, we've done residencies, so I think we all know the the things that interfere with the accuracy of end tidal CO2 monitoring. And just some references from the literature that question its accuracy in various circulation, uh, various situations. So I think end tidal is an essential monitoring device in the operating room, also in the ICU now in procedural sedation. It works well in patients with normal pulmonary function. As I mentioned, there are a lot of factors that affect its accuracy. And, you know, there's situations where you can't use end tidal. This is one of the first scenarios that we found transcutaneous to be incredibly effective. You know, obviously these patients' CO2s vary dramatically from hour to hour. So when you're on the oscillator, you can't measure end tidal. We do a lot of non-invasive ventilation. Okay, so BiPAP and CPAP, so you can't measure end tidal. Uh, you know, we use some CYPAP. And we certainly use a lot of high flow nasal cannula devices. And because of the flow required in these devices, end tidal is notoriously inaccurate. So we use a, a lot of transcutaneous CO2 monitoring in the non intubated patient on non invasive ventilation. And then in the operating room, if we're doing supraglottic jet ventilation for kids having airway surgery, we use it during one lung ventilation, so we've put a blocker in the operative lung, you've obviously created a huge VQ mismatch in this patient, which affects end tidal um, accuracy. And then occasionally in the operating room for some of the thoracoscopic procedures, we use jet ventilation intraoperatively to limit lung movement. So let's spend about 10 minutes to finish up and talk about some of the applications of transcutaneous CO2 monitoring. Now, being American, we talk about millimeters of mercury for CO2, so I've not changed all my slides. There are, there are a couple of things I publish in the British literature that I've used kilopascals on, and I remember getting the reviews back from that paper, and I was like, oh my goodness, but it's fairly easy to convert. So you'll just have to, again, when I talk millimeters or mercury, if you're used to kilopascals, there's the conversion factor. So how did I get into this? Well, a long time ago, I um, took a job at the University of Missouri, and when I started working in their ICU, they had a great respiratory therapy staff, and they were using transcutaneous CO2 monitoring. And I was like, well, that doesn't work, you know, except in neonates, that was the only place I'd seen it, and they were like, you know, yes, it does. And of course, I knew everything because I was young. And I was like, no, it doesn't. So we made a bet. And so we did a study. And then, uh, you know, I had to take everybody out to dinner one night and admit that I was wrong. And it really did work. But to me, it showed that, you know, transcutaneous CO2, again, I think the technology is a little more difficult to learn than end tidal. So you have to have a staff that is invested in the devices and knows how to use them. This is the first study we did. We just took a cohort of neonates and infants, toddlers, um, average age of about one to 40 months, but they had respiratory failure, they were intubated. And so a lot of them had significant lung disease. 
And if you look here, we found a fairly low transcutaneous to CO2 to PCO2 gradient, much higher with n tidal. And then one of the things I like to do when looking at the values is rather than looking at the absolute difference, look at the number that are within three, four, or five of the PCO2. And for this study, we arbitrarily picked within four. And we found that transcutaneous performed much better. So these would be typical bronchiolytics, pneumonia patients who are, are intubated. And this is the Bland-Altman analysis. And one of the nice things the Bland-Altman shows you is that, especially when you are hypercarbic, so these are patients where we're doing permissive hypercarbia. And who gets permissive hypercarbia? The patients with horrible lung disease and ARDS. So they're going to have the most VQ mismatch. And in that population, we know that n tidal is notoriously inaccurate. And I think these, uh, these graphs illustrate that very nicely. We then went on and said, OK, I said, that was great in these younger patients. What about older patients? Because I was convinced you know, if I had adolescents that it wasn't going to work. But again, we found that transcutaneous performed much better than n tidal. And again, when looking at the absolute difference, it was significantly better. And again, these are intubated patients, so they're going to have significant VQ mismatch, dead space issues, and problems with you know, ventilation. We then did a study in the, on the oscillator. And of course, well, there's no end title with which to compare it. But to me, I think this is one clinical scenario where the transcutaneous is really mandatory when you're doing high frequency oscillatory ventilation, you really want to know what your PCO2 is. And the one thing we found was that unlike in tidal monitoring, it doesn't really matter whether your PCO2 is high or low, is your patient hypercarbic or not, the transcutaneous is equally as accurate. We then moved on and thought, uh, you know, my anesthesia practice at that time was a mixed practice. So I thought, well, let's really stress the system here and let's look at morbidly obese adult patients. These were patients having open gastric bypass surgery. And we found was we used the volar aspect of the arm um, and put it there. And we found remarkably that even in these morbidly obese adults, the transcutaneous CO2 monitoring was, was very effective. And then a few years back, we repeated this study um, at Nationwide Children's Hospital. These were adolescents having bariatric surgery, and we found that you know, even in this population, the transcutaneous is, is very accurate. We looked at it, and this is some, some interesting data in patients following cardiac surgery, and we identified a clinical scenario where transcutaneous CO2 doesn't work. So when you are hypoperfused, significantly hypoperfused, or when you are on medications that are vasoconstrictors, you vasoconstrict to the skin, and the ratio between the transcutaneous and the arterial CO2 widens. So we found that, and the magic numbers for cutoff were pretty high, you know, dopamine of 20 and epinephrine above 0.3. The transcutaneous CO2 monitor is 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 relatively inaccurate at that point. But other than that, you know, even on some fairly significant inotropic support, uh, the transcutaneous still worked. And obviously, if you're on vasodilator drugs in this scenario, uh, dobutamine, milrinone, nicardipine, it worked very well. And excluding those patients who were on the high-dose dopamine or epinephrine, the gradient was similar to what we had seen in the non-cardiac population. And so, I mentioned earlier that we had had some problems in our cardiothoracic ICU with a couple of uh, cardiac arrests in the middle of the night, whether it was related to the suppressant effects of dexmedetomidine on sinus node function. We weren't sure, but part of our protocol to hopefully prevent that was end tidal CO2 monitoring and transcutaneous CO2 monitoring. And so now, all of our neonates and infants in the cardiothoracic intensive care unit have both monitors attached. The majority of our patients come back extubated from the operating room. So we were wondering if we were missing some slow, slow problem with respiratory or cardiovascular function resulting in hypercarbia. And again, we've not really identified the problem, but as we protocolize the sedation, 
the pain regimen and really upped our monitoring, we've seemed to eliminated these uh, events. So we kind of branched out with this and we thought, well, let's look at monitoring transcutaneous CO2 in patients who are hyperventilating for, from diabetic ketoacidosis. So some of these patients had PCO2s in the teens or even lower than that. And so we were wondering how accurate the transcutaneous CO2 monitor would be. And even with significant hypocarbia, we found that it was quite accurate. And then we developed a little formula. And so one of the interesting things is as you're caring for these patients, you can watch the acidosis resolve in the absence of lung function, uh, problems with lung function or depression of ventilatory function, you can watch the PCO2 go up as the pH goes up and the acidosis resolves. So just another uh, clinical scenario where you might want to consider transcutaneous CO2 monitoring. We've used it in apnea testing. One of the problems we have with apnea testing, as you, as you know, is that the PCO2 rise is incredibly variable. In some patients, it goes up two a minute. In others, it goes up four. And some of the problems you have is as you're doing the apnea test is when do you draw the blood gas? Because you want to catch that PCO2 more than 60, but you don't want to wait too long because if your patient gets too acidotic, obviously you can have some cardiovascular dysfunction. So basically, just to summarize, what we found was that if we waited till the transcutaneous got to be about 70, then we were pretty sure that the PCO2 would be more than 60 and we would have a, I never know whether that's a positive or a negative apnea test, but you, know, you would then document your PCO2 60 and your patient's not breathing. We did see a little bit of a wider gradient than we saw in some of our other studies, and I'm not sure if this is just a calibration time or, or what is responsible for that. And then there's a, a nice paper in the adult literature where they were especially concerned about the effects of the hypercarbia and acidosis. So they don't want to let this apnea testing go on any longer than they absolutely have to. And unlike our study, they found that when the transcutaneous was 60, they were ready to, to draw their blood gas. So 60, 70, again, I think it's a very useful monitor for apnea testing. A couple nice uh, neonatal transport studies. Again, you know, in the helicopter and the ambulance, you really can't monitor blood gases. And they found by using transcutaneous CO2, they could adjust their ventilation during transport. And so when you arrive, you know, you're not hypercarbic and you're keeping the patient more in the desired CO2 range. And another transport study, um, again, you were able to adjust ventilation effectively and your patient was more likely to arrive with a normal pH and a normal PaCO2. And I, when I was putting this together and updating my slides, I came across this in the Swiss Medical Weekly. So obviously people are uh, already using uh, transcutaneous CO2 monitoring um, here in Switzerland. So this is obviously nothing new. Um, so just to summarize, I think the advantages are the device is going to be more accurate than in title in many clinical scenarios. I mean, if you've got perfectly normal lungs, end title is usually spot on. Um, you know, again, your end title is going to be two or three lower. Your transcutaneous may be a couple higher. Um, I, I like the transcutaneous CO2 when we, you're doing non-invasive ventilation. When I look back to now versus 20 years, I mean, we avoid intubation in so many patients with high flow nasal cannula, CPAP, and BiPAP. And those are the patients you really want to know what your PCO2 is, because I think the adult literature is somewhat worrisome in that we know that some of the studies suggest that the use of non invasive ventilation may actually increase mortality. And I think some of that is. You know, they may wait too long to intubate. So I think having a continuous monitor of CO2 is very helpful in these scenarios. Um, the accuracy is not affected by pulmonary disease, VQ mismatch. So your patients with shunt, congenital heart disease, very accurate monitor. It's not affected by small tidal volumes or rapid respiratory rates. And we can use it with high frequency ventilation. The disadvantage is, yeah, it's a little more labor intensive. I have seen a dramatic uh, 
improvement over 20 years in this technology, but it obviously still has to be set up and calibrated and the membranes have to be put on. Um, accuracy is going to be affected somewhat by low perfusion states, but higher doses of vasoconstricting agents. There's a little bit of a lag time um, potential for a super superficial blister. I think anybody that you know, tr talks about transcutaneous CO2 monitoring, we always think about the olden days when the probe heated up to 45 degrees, it now heats up to a lower temperature. So there's a lot less of a potential for blistering. Um, and then I think we're all just less familiar with it than, than end title. We use, uh, you know, we started using transcutaneous CO2 uh, in the operating room at Nationwide Children's Hospital seven years ago when I got there. Not a lot of people had used it, so I think we had to do some appropriate education uh, regarding it. Um, there's a newer device, so you now uh, not only can have transcutaneous CO2, but you can get PO2 uh, neonates, and you can also get pulse oximetry. So there are lots of options for the devices, but you can get transcutaneous CO2 and pulse oximetry from, from the probe. So just to summarize, there's a review article I wrote a few years ago in pediatric anesthesia. It provides an accurate, continuous estimation of arterial CO2. Um, end title monitoring remains a standard of care to document the intratracheal position of the endotracheal tube. The end title CO2 is generally less than your PaCO2, which is less than your transcutaneous CO2. I think the two monitors should be used together. Okay, I don't think it's an either or. Um, I think we can use them both together. Um, and there's expanding use of transcutaneous CO2 monitoring outside of the PICU, including postoperative monitoring of respiratory status in patients res receiving opioids. You know, as a pediatric ICU doctor and a pediatric anesthesiologist, I use a lot of transcutaneous CO2 monitoring, but I think the real role and a significant role of this device is going to be to answer the problem we're seeing with adults who have undiagnosed OSA. And, you know, these patients come into the hospital, they have a surgical procedure, and they're put on their PCA device. And then we have, a, I think, a, what some have said is an epidemic of adult patients dying of opioid-induced respiratory depression. So I think we're seeing more use of this device monitoring adult patients on the inpatient wards after they've had surgical procedure when they're receiving uh, opioids. And, you know, this has been a big push of the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation because we, we are seeing a lot of patients who are having respiratory depression from, from opioids. And that's all I've got. Thank you very much. <laughs> Joseph? Yeah. Oh, question. Yes, sir. Can I uh, ask a question? Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of transcutaneous CO2 measurements. Uh, however, I face quite often the challenge of my colleagues yeah. saying that, uh, what's the point of doing so? And the common argument that I hear is the following, that they say, uh, whatever the number is there, it's not going to change my management. So uh, in view of to start ventilation, uh, they say, I'm never going to use any blood gas parameter to actually, you know, trigger the intubation ventilation of a patient. So why should I continuously measure it? Because yeah. even a capillary gas or an arterial gas is not going to tell me if I have to intubate. So why should I use a transcutaneous CO2 measurements when I uh, even neglect the true uh, Rolls-Royce of an intra or an arterial gas. Yeah. Uh, so how would you argue against that? Yeah. Well, I would say, well, first, I think there are a host of patients we take care of where we know that their long-term outcome is going to be markedly worse if they are inadvertently hypocarbic, you know, the neonate population. So if I'm taking care of a neonate in the PICU or in the operating room, we know that periods of hypocarbia are associated with periventricular leukomalacia. And if you walk through my operating room, like every operating room in this world, 
a lot of patients are inadvertently hyperventilated, and we've actually done studies and shown that. Um, patients with traumatic brain injury, you know, okay, end title's great. A lot of those patients don't have lung disease, but if they do and your end title isn't working, we knew 20 years ago that hyperventilation was bad for those patients. So I start by focusing on those patients where I believe normal carbia is very important. And I would never intubate on a blood gas value because I, I'm the first one to, you know, when the fellows come to me, I'm always the one that I, I get my glasses on and I'm like, oh, oh yeah, you have a stethoscope. Why don't we go examine that patient and see because they're worried about a blood gas. I said, well, let's go see what clinically the patient's doing. But I think when you're working in a busy ICU and you have 36 kids with bronchiolitis and you can't be there looking at everyone every second, it's really nice to know whose CO2 is going up and whose CO2 is not, because I think it may help you intervene. It may, you may say, oh, their PCO2 is going up, and yeah, when you look at them, you're like, yeah, they are working harder to breathe, but the nurse didn't call you because they're working harder to breathe. They called you because you know, a simple objective measure has changed. And so for me, I, I think that it's part and we certainly add it to the clinical assessment of the patient, but I mean, you know, we, we just finished a winter where, you know, all 36 beds are full of kids on BiPAP and CIPAP and high flow. None, we, none of them have art lines, um, and they all have transcutaneous CO2 monitors on, so I know where the next fire is going to be. So, I mean, I guess if I had eight patients and I could watch every one of them, I probably wouldn't need it. So. Um, I just think it's another monitor, and it's just so easy to use. Why wouldn't you add it to your armamentarium, is what I would say. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Do you see a, a clear clinic, clinical indication for using both entitled <laughs> CO2 monitoring and transcutaneous CO2 monitoring? Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I think we get a lot of value from both of them. Um, and, and I, I like looking at, you know, my ARDS patients where I'm trying to figure out what the, you know, on the oscillator or I, when I'm, sorry, when I'm adjusting PEEP, I'm trying to figure out optimal PEEP. I mean, there are lots of ways to do that. But I think sometimes as you look at it, you know, as you decrease your dead space, you know, your arterial to transcutaneous CO2 gradient may, may narrow somewhat. So I think it tells you a lot about your pulmonary mechanics when you compare the two. I mean, in the operating room, it's always uh, amazing to me, you know, when we're doing a, a BT shunt, you know, how the, the end title jumps, you know, and the shunt is open. And, you know, I, I would love to, you know, as the years go on, look at these, you know, this gradient as, you know, a way of changing how we're ventilating patients. Um, you know, if somebody's got absolutely normal lungs, no, I don't, I don't put the transcutaneous CO2 on them, but for the patient with lung disease, I think looking at that gradient is helpful. And like I said, I mean, end title is standard of care as far as I'm concerned with everybody in the ICU, because again, in a busy ICU, yeah, they should know if the endotracheal tube comes out, but sometimes the first thing we get called to the bedside for is, you've, lost, you've been there, right? Oh, I don't know what's going on. We lost the end tidal CO2 gradient. And I'm like, um, I don't think that endotracheal tube's in. And they're always like, oh, how could that happen? So I think you have to have end tidal on everybody that's intubated. Um, and I think putting the transcutaneous on tells you a lot because it gives you a second to second gradient. Um, using those devices. And, and maybe we'll figure out that, you know, pe people are looking at dead space and does dead space predict outcome in ARDS, but maybe we can titrate PEEP based on this gradient. So I think we have a lot more work to do. Thanks. <laughs>